Welcome to the Historical Romance Sampler Podcast, the place for you to find new historical romance books and authors to fan over. I'm award-winning historical romance author Katherine Grant, and each week I'm inviting fellow authors to come on and share a little bit of their work and themselves. They'll read a sample of one of their books, and then I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions. By the end of the episode, you'll have a sense of what they write and who they are. Hopefully, you and I both will have something new to read. So what are we waiting for? Let's get into this week's episode. All right, well, welcome back to the Historical Romance Sampler Podcast. Today, I am joined by New York Times best-selling author Erica Ridley. Erica is the author of witty, feel-good historical romance novels, including The Duke Heist, First in the Wild Winchester's Family of Caper Committing Siblings. Other fan favorite series include The Dukes of War, Rogues to Riches, and The Twelve Dukes of Christmas, and those all feature roguish peers and dashing war heroes amid the splendor and madness of Regency England. When not reading or writing romances, Erica can be found eating couscous in Morocco, ziplining through rainforests in Costa Rica, or getting hopelessly lost in the middle of Budapest. Welcome, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, So today you're reading an excerpt from Hot Earl Summer, which is the next book in the Wild Winchesters. So for any readers who haven't yet caught up on the series, can you give a quick pitch on what they're missing out on? Sure. So this is a a very fun series, if I do say so myself, because uh, we've got this wild family of caper committing siblings. What that means is if you've ever seen the TV show Leverage or heard of superheroes, they've got kind of a Robin Hood vibe. So they're out uh, fighting for justice, whatever it takes. And there's heists in every book, lots of banter and shenanigans. And it has been a blast to write. And I hope you have a lot of fun reading them as well. It is a really fun series. And it is, like you said, like they're after justice and it's kind of found family vibe. So it's a lot of fun. Go read it. But first, hear this excerpt from Hot Earl Summer, which is coming out in 2024. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here's the blurb. No one's ever heard this yet before because it's, this is an excerpt of a book that hasn't been released. Bold, curvy Elizabeth Winchester loves cuddling hedgehogs almost as much as she adores vanquishing villains with the sharp blade concealed inside her cane. Despite others' opinions about her body and gender, nothing will stop her from seeing justice done. When her next mission drops her at the dastardly Earl of Densmore's castle, she is prepared to duel like gentlemen, only to be locked inside. Her trusty sword cannot defeat the castle's hidden traps, or protect her heart from the devilishly handsome rogue guarding the keep. When reclusive inventor Stephen Lennox agreed to impersonate his cousin for a few days, he did not expect the Earl to vanish altogether. Nor could Stephen predict mounting death threats or the arrival of a beguiling, blade-wielding spinster who declares herself his new bodyguard. As the Earl's enemies lay siege to the castle, Stephen fights his way past Elizabeth's defenses. She will share his bed, but when the adventure concludes, she vows to sever their affair, unless he can somehow convince a swashbuckling siren to surrender her heart. I'm very excited for this, so I'll let you take it away, Erica. Thank you so much. This was um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to write. Um, Elizabeth is so swashbuckly, and Stephen is this hilarious uh, tinker. So he makes these Rube Goldberg devices. So he has filled this castle with booby traps, essentially, like think Goonies, there's machines everywhere and uh, leads to a lot of uh, fun. So here is a scene where they lay eyes on each other for the first time. Mm-hmm. Another day, another batch of ominous correspondence. With a sigh, Stephen opened the newest missive from Richard Reddington. Did sons of Viscounts truly have nothing else to do all day but scribble increasingly bloodthirsty threats to the Earl next door? Stephen skimmed the letter. Reddington was demanding immediate occupancy of Castle Harbor grounds. Consider this your official warning, Stephen read aloud. We're watching you. If you fail to hand over that deed, Mr. Reddington shall assume control by force, even if it means laying siege on his own castle. 
Oh, for the love of God. Stephen wouldn't fall for that. No spoiled lordling was choleric enough to storm his own castle. We're watching you, Stephen repeated in aristocratic accents, of all the idle, idiotic threats. Reddington's country estate did adjoin the castle property, but a dense strip of woods stretched between them. Reddington could station a man at every window of his resplendent manor, and at best, all he would see were three acres of trees. Nonetheless, the sinister tone was unsettling enough that Stephen dropped to the stone floor for a round of press-up exercises. His anxious thoughts tended to ping and flail and spiral like the complex machines he put together. Concentrating on the flexing of his muscles and the breaths in his lungs calmed the noise and helped Stephen to think. He was angry was the problem. Angry with his flighty cousin for losing a castle he didn't own in a card game. He was also vexed with himself for being hoodwinked into this ruse to begin with. Nonetheless, Stephen was undeniably a better earl than the earl. In addition to settling accounts and making profitable investments and overseeing improvements on the various entailed properties, Stephen had also gone ahead and given every member of staff a rise in wages, after which boredom had threatened, which was why Stephen had turned this castle into his laboratory away from home. He missed his books and his bed and his devices. Even though there were more staff in Castle Harbrook, the building somehow felt emptier and lonelier. A bold claim from a man so lonely, he spent every waking moment filling the emptiness in his life with machine after machine. Nonetheless, Stephen would defend this castle to the best of his considerable ability. Richard Reddington would not cross Castle Harbrook's threshold without Stephen's knowledge and authorization. No one would. Bells clanged overhead. Stephen jerked his head up to stare at them. Those bells were part of an early warning system he'd installed to ring when the property line had been crossed. Had the hidden archer been replaced with an even bolder attack? Stephen kept telescopes in all four of the castle's corner turrets, but those bells specifically signaled that a vehicle had arrived on the northern side, facing the street. It wasn't a delivery. The most recent shipment had come in yesterday, and the next wouldn't arrive until tomorrow. He hurried to the stone windows. A cross breeze flowed through the large rectangular openings on all four sides of the cylindrical turret. Ducking so that he could not be seen, Stephen pressed one eye to the telescope. A humble pony cart trudged into view. It was an ordinary country gig. Simple, mud splattered. The pony lumbering up the private road was just as unassuming. Brown, short of stature, a general air of boredom with its task. Inside the gig, was a long, thin crate and a woman whose visage was hidden beneath an enormous, wide-brimmed bonnet. He could not guess her age without a glimpse of her face, but one daintily gloved hand clutched the handle of a stout wooden cane. The beast drew to a stop. The woman climbed out of the gig with obvious gingerness, as though the ride up the hill had been exactly as arduous an experience as the pony cart's appearance implied. The wind whipped her dress against her body, revealing plump curves. Stephen changed his mind about being able to guess her age. The morning gown was of fine quality and tailored to flatter the woman's voluptuous shape. This was a young lady, walking like an old woman. Fashionable, but unchaperoned. Moneyed, but riding an absolute turnip of a pony cart. Stephen was certain of his conclusions, yet they did not sum up to anything he could compute. The more he watched the woman, the less he understood. Was she here to sell him something? She left her crate in the gig, and the gig untethered. The pony, for its part, seemed content to gnaw at the tall green grass, of which there was plenty. The grounds were covered in flowers and greenery for the pony's pleasure. Another gust of wind rose from the west, sending the brim of the woman's bonnet flying up away from her face. Just for a second, it was enough. Stephen swallowed hard. He had no idea who this woman was, but she was extraordinarily beautiful. A missionary, perhaps, here to chastise the Earl for failing to attend church on Sunday, again. Perhaps the crate was full of Bibles. He tilted his telescope to keep her in sight. The woman glanced around the door for the knocker. Stephen had removed it months ago to make the entrance less welcoming. She made a fist with her free gloved hand and banged on the door with that. He would never have heard it were it not for another system he'd installed to carry sound up through narrow tunnels he'd bored into reinforced stone walls. 
surely Dunsmore wouldn't mind, in order to eavesdrop on any enemies who might approach. Stephen called it a whispering lull because it transmitted the slightest sound. The visitor banged again, louder. Stephen did not respond to her call, neither did the servants. Before the Earl abandoned his castle and its occupants, he had instructed his staff just as firmly as he lectured Stephen, let no one in. Undaunted, the woman lifted her cane and used that to rap against the castle's thick oak door. This could be heard with or without the aid of any listening contraptions. Its racket also went unanswered. I know you're in there, she called up. I can see smoke from your kitchen. Stephen fought the urge to yell back, your logic is unsound. Smoke from the kitchen means someone is at home, but it doesn't mean that I am. For one, this rejoinder would give away his position. For two, perhaps she was here to visit one of the scullery maids. He was certain this visitor wasn't here for the Earl of Dunsmore. No man with half a brain would leave a woman this beautiful behind. She rapped again with the heavy cane. Please, she pleaded, I've come from so far. Take pity on a weary traveler, I beg you. Stephen could not help but feel sorry for her predicament. She seemed harmless and nice enough, but rules were rules for a reason. If he let her in just because she was pretty and carried a cane, who knew what would be next? An army of missionaries with five carts worth of Bibles? She rapped one last time, then heaved a breath. Silence stretched around the castle. Even the wind stilled and the bird silence and the tree leaves ceased to rustle. No one was answering her plea. Not even nature itself stirred. Have it your way, she muttered. Stephen heard the words as clearly as if the fetching visitor were whispering against the back of his neck. Beth the berserker it is. He blinked. Perhaps he had not heard her clearly. It had sounded as though she'd said. The woman marched toward the pony cart with her cane held high, like a field commander leading a platoon of marching soldiers into battle. She handed a bit of carrot to the pony, then tossed her cane inside the gig and ripped off her dainty gloves. With her bare hands, she wrenched open the wooden crate. From in its depths, she withdrew two enormous battle axes. Stephen stared in disbelief as the woman raised each into the air. Beneath the feminine poofs at her shoulders, muscles visibly flexed in what had previously seemed to be deceptively soft flesh. Axes held high, she marched back to the front door without slowing her pace or panting for breath. She looked like a Valkyrie descending upon a battlefield. Who was this woman? The latest intimidation tactic by Richard Reddington? Was the archer not enough? Tell Reddington I'm not to be bothered, Stephen called out through the window. The woman jerked her gaze up to the turret, her previously pretty face a twisted mask of fury. How dare you imply I hold any affiliation with that scoundrel? Interesting. Before Stephen could apologize for his erroneous assumption, the woman let out a primal scream, ear-splitting enough to break glass, then began striking at the ten-inch thick oak door with enough force to rattle the iron hinges. There was no chance of anyone cutting through wood that impenetrable with an ordinary blade. Or, perhaps, Stephen amended, there was no chance of anyone ordinary doing so. Beth the Berserker was anything but ordinary. Five minutes later, neither the screaming nor the thrashing showed any signs of slowing. As the woman struck at the door with her axes, shards of wood flew up at all angles, spraying the air around her as though she were caught inside a dust storm. He either had to get rid of her, which seemed unlikely, or allow her in, which was forbidden. Then again, at this rate, Stephen wouldn't need to allow anything. It might take Miss Berserker three days of frenzied chopping, but one way or another, this woman was slashing and hacking her way into the castle. Very well, Stephen murmured. Have it your way. He rose to his feet and pressed a lever. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. I love it. There's so much going on in that scene. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, she has no idea what she just walked into. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Neither think he, he has any idea who he's <laughs> welcoming in. <laughs> also true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a bunch of questions for you. Before we get to them, we're going to take a break for our sponsors. So we can go ahead and drink some water. Hey samplers, it's Katherine Grant. I am interrupting this episode to tell you how to get a free book, The Viscount Without Virtue. First, go to bit.ly slash hrsfan. Go through the checkout process. This is where you add the promo code 
H-R-S-F-A-N. As your last step, just download your free ebook to your e-reader. All right, well, let's get back to this week's episode. All right, and we are back with Erica Ridley, who just read an amazing excerpt from Hot Earl Summer. When is that coming out, by the way? August. August 2024. All right. Well, it's up for pre-order. At least I saw a cover for it. Okay. So readers, you can go pre-order that right now. So you find out what happens once the battle axes are dropped, I guess. Um, I have so many questions for you. And one is in that scene, you were really establishing obviously the characters, but also this incredible setting of the castle and also what Steven has done to the castle. So I'm curious first, like, did you, have you always wanted to write a book about a castle? And then how did you start thinking about what would this castle specifically be like? Well, so a fun thing for me with this book is that I I am in fact interested in castles. And so when I visit places that have them, I always take tours and things like that. Um, But I've never written a medieval novel, I think because of the limitations, just the differences of the time period and, and what stories can be told. So it was very fun to kind of have the best of both worlds and to have the Regency atmosphere and technology, but also have an older castle. So yeah, I got to use some old, old research for a new book. Yeah. And was something like the Whispering Wall, did you invent that or is that something you've encountered? So it's a mix of a couple different things. Without spoiling the later thing in the book, I will say Whispering Walls have invented, have existed for a long time, Um, but also in addition to how Stephen is using the interior of the wall, um, for, for centuries as well, we've had the acoustics where you could whisper on one side of a large chamber and hear it clearly on the other side, but not in the middle, things like that. So that kind of technology did exist, although most people would not have known how to employ it. Got it. I've done that at Grand Central Station, so yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> um, and so there's so much physical comedy but also physical physical beats in this scene and it sounds like throughout the story about um you know weapons that she's using levers and bells and machines like is that something that you hold clearly in your head from the get-go or do you have to like sit down and brainstorm okay I want this machine to do this and if it's doing that it's this has to happen like how do you go about creating that physical element Well, so when it comes to his Rube Goldberg machines, I do kind of make those up on the fly. I just kind of try and think what's what's funny, what would be the most ridiculous thing that he can do in this moment. Um, There's a line later in the story that's something like, I didn't know adding milk to tea could be both time consuming and deadly until I met you. And that is how he lives (laughs) his life. Everything is just way more than necessary. And so it was a lot of fun trying to come up every time with just a different sequence of events that, you know, that could happen with his machines, whether it's a boot knocking into whatever and so forth. Um, And then just also trying to think of, you know, like what doesn't need a machine? And so what kind of machine would he build (laughs) to do that? (laughs) I'm thinking right now of um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Yes. With like the egg machine and like the haircut machine. Exactly. That, that's the visual I have right now. Um, so then throughout the Wild Winchesters, each sibling kind of has their own talent that they bring to this, to the capers that they commit. Um, so I'm curious, uh, first of all, how much you knew about all of that going into the series. And then secondly, like, for example, uh, you've teased in the blurb that Elizabeth is really good at dueling. Like, how much do you need to know about dueling to be able to write a character who's good at dueling? Yeah, so I did sit down and brainstorm when I was writing the very first book what each of the siblings' various talents would be. And so some of them have one key thing that they can do. In Elizabeth's case, she's not just good at sword fighting. She can also throw her voice and you know mimic people. So that also comes in very useful during the capers that they perform. Um, And so I generally have had to do quite a bit of research into some of the different skills because they're not skills that I have. And in a previous book, I I actually went to a shooting range with a bow and arrow and, you know, experienced firsthand, you know, like how does that whole thing work? And it went badly enough that I did not sign up for fencing lessons. (laughs) (laughs) Not my Learned that lesson. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I totally bruised my arm with the bone. I'm not good at it. Oh, no. Um, yeah, but I have a lot more respect now for, for archers. Like, I learned about that. And I do have friends that do fencing uh, for whom I can ask questions. And this book specifically, she's not always fencing in the way that you would if you were doing so professionally and following rules. She has to very much defend herself against someone who's not fighting fair. Uh, so there's a little bit more flexibility in that way, too, when it comes to the fight scenes. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so do you find that you have an idea, research it, write it? Do you constantly do research and that informs your ideas? Is it a combination? How do you approach that? So it's a little bit of a combination. If I have an idea, but it's about something that I'm completely clueless about, then I, I probably will stop and research it and make sure that it's viable first. Sometimes I can I can get ahead of myself and then it turns out that the thing I wanted to do, you can't really do or, or whatever. Um, but other times it's, it's so easy to go down a rabbit hole of research and you know you just mean to jump on Google for 30 seconds and five hours later you've consumed half of Wikipedia. Um, so I, I do try to put a little limit on it, a little child lock on my phone when it comes to these things, uh, so that I do write and so, but I do look up things as I go. I, I try to train myself to just leave notes for things that, that I can look up later if it's not critical in the moment. Like if mm -hmm. I need to know, you know, how many hours in a, on a horse from this place to that place, or like what style of boots would she have worn in this year or something like that. It's not plot critical. But if it is something that would determine the course of the scene, then I do stop and research in that moment before I move forward. Yeah, that makes sense. I also leave brackets for myself. I'm like, deal with this later. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I am curious, you have been writing for a while now. You have a big body of work. And I am behind you in terms of that, but I'm beginning to develop my own body of work. And I'm noticing in myself that I'm returning, not necessarily, I mean, I am returning to tropes, but I also am beginning to feel like, oh, this is a theme that I guess I have this question because I keep returning to it. Um, I'm curious whether you have noticed any themes in your work that come up for you and um, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, like there's some that came up without my intention uh for example it wasn't until i'd probably written eight or ten of them that i realized hidden identities or, or you know secret mm. identities were a thing for me but i i love it i love those in stories and apparently i love to write it too um, yeah so yeah that that kind of thing and found family comes up a lot in mine but i think that also comes up in my in my real life so i'm kind of writing my worldview or my experience in that way without consciously doing so of course yeah that makes a lot of sense I think for me anyway, my writing is part of the way I process the world. And so these things that I'm beginning to pattern recognize, it's helpful for me to pattern recognize. Can I, I can say, oh, maybe I need to think about how that comes back into my real life and what do I want to do with that? Yeah. Um, you recently announced that you are also going to be writing a YA horror series, or at least a, a book, a YA horror a book. book. Yeah. Um, I am curious, in writing that book, did you discover or were you surprised by any ways that horror and romance have things in common? Um, hmm, that's a good question. So there is kind of a romantic subplot in my horror novel. So so there is just straightforward. There, there is a love interest there. Um, but also I would say it, my first my first historical romance novels were gothic and so i would say writing horror is closest to that it's you know setting the scene and the vibe and you know having things be ominous matters more in that kind of book so there's a lot of similarities there oh that's an interesting i have i don't read a lot of horror so i didn't have that in my mind but it's interesting that for horror there's so much establishment that needs to be done to make it that genre that's very interesting yeah, it's very much a vibe thing, you know, something that wouldn't be scary. There's a knock at the door, you know, so what, right? But <laughs> yeah. but you can make it scary, but it's, yeah. it's, a, it's very much, you know, you have to set the mood. Oh, that's interesting. And is there, are there any lessons that you learned from writing horror that you're going to bring back to your romance writing? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Well, we'll see. We'll see after I get my developmental edits back from my editor who has not yet read the book. Um, <laughs> so I'm very curious, you know, 
uh, scared slash excited to, to get her feedback and to work on this. And I'm sure there will be lessons that I draw, but in, until I hear her insights, it's hard for me to really guess. Yeah, totally fair. Cool. Well, I think it is time to move to our segment. Are you a romantic? Are you a romantic? So in this segment, I have a series of questions and um, we're going to use them to determine how romantic you are. So which do you trust more, your heart, your gut, or your brain? So my brain, I consider myself logical and I research and read about everything because I do love to have facts. Nice. Good for you. I'm someone who thinks, I think with my heart and I'm very envious of people who think with their brains. <laughs> All right. Do you believe in love at first sight? I'm a bad romance author because I'm going to say no, though I do believe <laughs> in lust at first sight, but I think love comes from truly knowing another person. All right. And so therefore you believe lust and love are different. I do. To, to me, lust is physical. It's biology. Whereas love is emotional. It's like understanding another person and treasuring them just as they are, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you believe in soulmates? I don't believe in one single soulmate. I think it would be kind of depressing odds if we had to find that one person in 8 billion in the whole world that was right for us. <laughs> I think we have a lot of options with potential and I do believe you can experience true love with more than one person, like whether that means for you, Polly, or moving on after a divorce or a death or, or whatever. I, I don't think we're so limited. Yeah. Yeah. What makes an apology meaningful? Well, genuine remorse for sure. Um, no excuses given and then a good faith ongoing effort to prevent whatever precipitated the apology to ever happen again. I like that answer. And our final question is, why is romantic love important? I think that having a romantic partner makes us feel like we belong, that we have something worth cherishing, that we're seen and understood, special and worthy, that that we're not just a priority in someone else's life, but number one to the very person who's number one to us. That's a really good way of putting it. Because if you're number one to someone that you don't care about, it's kind of like, you could make me not your number one. But if you're, if someone is your number one, then it's so heartwarming for them to make you their number one. Exactly. I like how you put that. All right, you are joining us in the ranks of a pragmatic realist. Ooh. I'm sorry, pragmatic romantic. Awesome. Believe in love, but not so much that you can't uh, have some differentiators there. So, <laughs> awesome. well, thank you so much for taking my romance. Are you a romantic segment quiz? And thank you also for joining the episode. Where can our readers keep in touch with you? Uh, so I can be found on all the socials as Erica Ridley, E-R-I-C-A, and uh, also my website, ericaridley.com. So I look forward to meeting you on the internet. Yes, I recommend signing up for Erica's newsletter. There are free books involved and fun updates from her travels. And also, um, you always get the news when there are steals and deals on some of the books. So Very true. Yeah. I will keep you informed. <laughs> thank you again and we will keep in touch and happy reading excellent thank you for having me that's it for this week check out the show notes where i put links for my guests myself and the podcast until next week happy reading